listening to Can't Feel the Heat, the Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival unofficial podcast, the number one Coachella podcast on the internet. Our mission is to explore the complexities of Coachella, covering the news, music, artists, technology, and business of the greatest music festival in the world. Subscribe to this podcast, follow us on Instagram at Can't Feel the Heat, and visit our website at www.can'tfeeltheheat.com. Can't Feel the Heat is produced by Tom Nash in Redondo Beach, California. Welcome back to Can't Feel the Heat. I'm Tom Nash. Our co-host is Vanessa Franco. Hi. And friend of the pod, Caleb Aldridge is here. Hey. Our guest today is Hana. Hana is a one-woman orchestra combining music, tech, and art with Nordic and Icelandic influences set to a broken beat, often featuring avant-garde ballerinas in her stage shows, including her official music video, Gold. She has toured around the world with her original music as a one-woman show and has worked with brands such as Apple, Ferrari, and Nike. She has also composed music for a few films, including documentaries for Time Magazine and Red Bull. Welcome, Hana. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Hana, we're so happy to have you here. As always, we like to start off each episode with a little bit of a news update. And Vanessa Franco always leads our news update. So what is the latest news, Vanessa? I have so much news. There's so much news. The big news today just happened. Breaking, if you will. Burning Man's canceled for 2021. Womp womp. I'm very sad about this. You know, a lot of, especially a lot of the art that we see at Coachella has a lot of connections to Burning Man. A lot of the folks I know at the Do Lab also go to Burning Man. So I'm, I'm sad that that's not happening for them, but I understand why. Obviously, we are still in the pandemic. And other festival news, you might have heard EDC, Electric Daisy Carnival, was supposed to happen in May in Las Vegas. And guess what? It's not happening in May. It's moved to October. I don't know if anyone's really shocked by it, but I am surprised by how long they waited to tell people. And people are not happy. It was ballsy that they thought that was happening in May, right? Like, that was a shocker that anyone thought that was happening in May. I was shocked. I wasn't shocked when they canceled it, but I was shocked that they thought they could pull it off. Yeah. But I mean, things are moving at a pretty, like quick clip now, right? Like, so one of the other Southern California festivals, SoCal Hoedown, that moved, it was supposed to be in June. They've actually pushed it to September. It's actually, it's going to be near you, Tom, and uh, at the LA waterfront in San Pedro. And that one, it's got like real big fish. So it's like, you know, it's got some like warp tour of late nineties vibes going on with it. That one's moving, but there's really big news for all of our listeners who are outside of the state of California. Last week, the state changed its guidelines So now out-of-state visitors can go to concerts. They can also go to Disneyland, but they can go to concerts, which is what we care about. Now, what the state isn't saying is what this means for festivals. As of June 15th, California is supposed to go back to pre-pandemic capacity. So like you could theoretically have a full-on show, but they're saying like if you have a convention or you have a music festival, you might be required to have vaccination proof. You might have to get a negative test. Everything's really up in the air. So that's like something that's still very much developing. However, we are looking to have our first major concert in Southern California in a year this weekend. SoFi Stadium is opening up. They're doing this big benefit show called Vax Live. It's not going to air on like media networks until May, but it's got Jay Balvin, former Coachella player, her, yes, Foo Fighters, Jennifer Lopez and Eddie Vedder. Like I mean, it's a really weird group, but they are playing. It's happening on Sunday. They are going to open it up to tens of thousands, well, potentially tens of thousands of vaccinated people. Like, so you have to be through your vaccination, like two weeks post your second shot, or if you have the Johnson and Johnson, your one and only shot. And it's to encourage people to get vaccinated. So it's big because it's going to be the first like music we see inside SoFi Stadium. And it's also big because it's going to be the first concert we've seen in Southern California in more than a year, which is just insane to think about. And then on the Coachella front, very happy to report, I have some Coachella news for all of us. Jimmy Eat World released their most incredible 2011 set on YouTube. And that just gives me all the feelings because I remember that set and like it was such a like sunny, bright afternoon. And it was a really great year. Like 2011 was one of my favorite years of Coachella. 
So uh, you can watch that on YouTube, and that's really exciting. Woo-hoo. Yeah, I'm so I'm so glad they released that. I wish more artists would, would release their Coachella sets on YouTube, but I was there for Jimmy Eat World. That was a lot of fun. I was there too. It's a good one. Fun. Nostalgic. Hey, Vanessa, do you think uh, there's any chance that other festivals are going to get canceled? What do we think? Are we on Festival Watch still, or was it just EDC? We are We are still on Festival Watch. So after EDC, the next one that's supposed to happen is also Insomniac, and oh. it is Beyond Wonderland in San Bernardino in June. Hmm. I, I don't feel good about that one, if I'm being honest, because they haven't really released many details. They've released details about Hard Summer, which is going to be at the same venue in San Bernardino, July 31st and August 1st. Mm-hmm. Although I'm still kind of iffy about that, um, especially since the county of San Bernardino didn't know anything about it and that like tens of thousands of people were going to be in the county. Surprise. Yeah. We're, I, I, they haven't really announced many details. They're also They're supposed to be starting a new festival July 3rd in San Pedro called day trip. That one I think might have a shot. Like LA County is looking better at that point. We're going to be out of the tiers. I think by like all these ones that we're starting to see move to September, I think have a real shot. Like just today, outside lands up in Northern California announced uh, the who's playing on what day they moved to Halloween weekend, Mm -hmm. but they announced the actual day by day lineups and they're putting single day tickets on sale. So I feel pretty confident that as long as people keep getting vaccinated and the numbers keep going down, like I think by September, yes, the summer ones are a little more iffy for me. I like it. I like it. Keep my fingers crossed for those, those, uh, those fall festivals. Yeah. So kind of mixed news, you know, we see concert happening in LA, but then at the same time, EDC is moved back. Burning Man is canceled whatever we'll figure it out just kind of moving forward it's this is the new normal yeah it very much is some good news some bad news we're making it happen that's right and i mean honestly things could change like by tomorrow again who knows like it's been such a whirlwind it'll all be exciting but you know what i do feel good about i think we will all be at coachella in april 2022 amen amen meet up at the do lab maybe i'm just saying (laughs) i'm putting it out there and do it well, we have an amazing guest today. I'm so excited that Hannah is here joining us. Hannah, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you first get your start as a musician playing violin? Thank you so much for bringing me on. It's really amazing. You know, I, I've been really spending a lot of time on Clubhouse lately, and that's actually how we connected. And there's something really intimate and really beautiful about connecting to people just by their voice. There's so much you can learn about somebody by just hearing their speaking voice, even their inflections, their mannerisms. And I think that when you take away some of the elements like you can't see my face, but you can hear my voice, how do I sound? What kinds of emotions am I expressing? And as an artist, these are things that I think about a lot with music. So I... um, I grew up playing violin. I started when I was three, actually, because of my mother. She just really wanted my sisters and I to get into the arts. And so I started playing when I was three and it was kind of expensive. So we kind of took a pause on that and I kept writing stories about it and, you know, having these visions of me playing in front of an orchestra in a pink dress and so eventually we got me a violin again and we got me lessons. And my very first recital, I actually wore a pink dress that my mother and I sewed and then wore that for my recital. And later I thought about that tie-in, you know, that I'd been doing all this visioning work and I didn't even know I was doing that. I was manifesting my dreams. And um, yeah, so my mother put us in arts classes, drawing classes, ballet, gymnastics, and also music. And so we had a very musical household growing up. She also taught me piano. And I would whistle all the time when I was little too. And at one point, one of my family members was like, you know, whistling is a sign of a nervous habit. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'll stop whistling. (laughs) But it was like this, I just was always very musical. And I also remember uh, writing haikus, like I was really into writing haikus. And some of my favorite words were silvery and misty. I don't think I've ever told anybody about this. So you're getting the first glimpse into my weird, quirky artist (laughs) um, (laughs) childhood. 
but yeah, I wrote these like really, you know, flowery haiku poems. Then, and then I also started learning photography. So coinciding, you know, doing music and then photography. I also started playing French horn and at some point figured out that I didn't enjoy playing classical music, but that's all that I knew. Meanwhile, my grandparents um, raised us with a lot of dance. So my grandmother is Czech and we did all this Eastern European folk dancing growing up, like every family gathering, we'd be dancing like Czech music and Bulgarian music and Greek music. And so I had these rhythms in my feet and there's something about like patterns. So when you're doing this Eastern European line dancing and you're in this big group in a room and there's the dance leader and they're leading the steps and then you're across the room from them and you have to interpret the steps, reverse them, like mirror the steps. So they're stepping with their right and you have to step with your left and memorizing these dance patterns. Well, I think that really tied into me down the line, future me past me now to kind of come up with these, you know, kind of interesting rhythms and ingrained in me. So at some point I discovered this artist called Claude Chaloub from Beirut and I heard his music and it was this really beautiful fusion of electronics and violin, very moody, very, you know, like kind of this landscape of sounds And I was like, that's what I want to do. But I had to kind of go on my own journey to figure out how to start developing electronic music production, how to learn those skills, how to learn different kinds of music theory that would support those interests because classical theory just wasn't really cutting it. I don't know. It's a, it's a long story, but fast forward to now, I am producer, violinist, vocalist, and, you know, creating these very cinematic Icelandic influenced, Nordic influenced, beat driven soundscapes that people can drop into. And, you know, we can get into more details along the way, (laughs) but that's in a nutshell. I really love kind of how you traveled from Eastern Europe West. Um, I'm Greek, so I totally understand what you're saying. Like those rhythms are just so unique. And now that you say that, like, I totally get that in your music. That's so great. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it definitely was a very meandering path. Sometimes I look back on it and I feel like I've lived 20 lives in the amount of things that I've done. But let me put it this way. You know, when somebody calls somebody a Renaissance woman or a Renaissance man, I think that all skills and talents can lead to one main talent or it can enhance or develop. Or sometimes you don't realize the things that you learn along the way, how they will tie into your current expression. But I believe everybody has their true passion or their gifts and how to figure out and how to boil or not boil, but, um, <laughs> like distill it, like you distill it. Yes. That's the word distill. <laughs> hmm. Perfect. So on your journey, you developed an interesting hybrid of organic live stringed instruments with electronic music production. And you mentioned an artist. Can you, can you say that artist's name again, that helped you discover that connection between electronic sounds and organic music and stringed instruments? Yes, his name is Claude Chaloub. I may be saying it wrong, but he is from Beirut. And this was when MySpace was a thing. So I found his music on MySpace. Or actually, I think it was through BMG where they did these music subscriptions where you could order those (laughs) CDs. And I would just like, you know, rip out all the stamps and put them on the order sheet. And that's really how I discovered, like I was crate digging with BMG's um, CD subscription. (laughs) And um, so I found Claude Chaloub's material there. And some of my other favorites were Buddha Bar and Delirium, Conjure One, Niaz, Voss, um, Azama Lee. There's something about this like global fusion music where there is It's partly traditional, but it's partly modern. It's electronic, but it's moody. It's not like, you know, mainstream EDM, 
but it's, I always say Massive Attack because that's my favorite band. Mm. (laughs) Bjork is another good example of just like this really eclectic fusion of analog and digital, creating these kind of alternate universes to drop into. So I definitely want to pick your brain a lot more about music, but since we are a Coachella podcast, you played Coachella in 2017 on Saturday, um, same day as Lady Gaga. You played the Do Lab, which we love the Do Lab, and we can all have a great conversation about the merits of the Do Lab. But can you just tell us a little bit about what was it like to play Coachella? It was one of the highlights, definitely. I mean, I have a great relationship with the Do Lab. They just create and curate such amazing experiences. I believe they are true tastemakers in their curation of their festival, Lightning in a Bottle, which I played on the Thunder stage in 2016, which was a huge honor at that time. You know, it's the base stage. And um, I had two dancers with me for that show. And then when I followed up with them about playing at Coachella, they were really enthusiastic about it. And I ended up bringing my two avant-garde ballerinas with me. And, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. It was my first time going to Coachella. So it's like the added intensity of putting on a performance and then also kind of navigating this incredible world that is Coachella. And um, I also camped there. (laughs) So I brought my shift pod and set it up and we got carted around. What's a shift pod? Oh, a shift pod is a tent that's kind of popularized at Burning Man, but now a lot of festivals, they were setting them up as like the glamping kind of situation. So it's basically an insulated eight by eight by eight hexagonal tent. And you just pop out the sides and it has a floor. You can stand up in it. You set it up in like two minutes. It has like little ports. So it kind of looks like a hexa yurt, but it's made out of flexible reflective material. And you were just in general camping? No, I was in the Do Lab artist camping. So okay. we had we had some amenities. <laughs> we had perks. And the benefit was that we didn't have to navigate all the traffic. So we could be on site and just basically attending it like a regular festival, but with the perks as an artist. And, you know, they had a pretty nice situation, pretty cushy situation set up there. But performing, I mean, I had a few different elements that were a little bit challenging, if we want to chat about those. (laughs) I remember that was a hot day. That was a really hot day. It was, oh my God, it was so hot. It was like over a hundred degrees and the green room where we were getting ready, they didn't have AC in there. (laughs) So we're sweating and then I'm braiding my ballerina's hair and then I'm doing an Instagram stories takeover for the do lab. And I'm just trying to, you know, multitask, do all these things. And, you know, it's the type of set where there's very little change over time. So I have a pretty complicated setup. You know, I use um, Ableton. I use some controllers. I use um, a MIDI controller keyboard. And then I have my violin and I have my vocals. And those are running through analog pedals. So I have that all set up backstage, ready to go. And as I go up to my laptop to get the final moments ready just before the changeover, my laptop's overheating. Oh my gosh. And so, you know, it's like aesthetic versus like, well, your laptop's overheating and so it wouldn't actually work. So they got some ice bottles, some ice water bottles and a fan and Fortunately, my laptop cooled off enough to be able to function to perform in that over 100 degree heat. (laughs) Yeah, that was a very stressful moment. I'm just glad that everything worked out. And actually, the librarian was after me and she was experiencing the same difficulty. So yeah. you you were not alone. Like that is something that definitely <laughs> happens. Like I've known like people who played on the main stage, like especially those early sets, like when the sun is right overhead. So you are, you are not alone, except yours held up through the whole set, which is even better. Cause like there are other, there are other people who I know have not been as lucky and have not had the, the heat Coachella gods looking out for them. <laughs> but I mean, like in, in the heat, because you had the ballerinas too. So like you couldn't even have like the water, the water cannons on stage, right? No. Yeah, we had to, you know, there's a lot of um, safety precautions we have to take when I do a show with the ballerinas. 
So Marlo is my main ballerina and Emily was the other ballerina there. And we had to uh, wipe down the stage right before I went on. And we couldn't have the super soakers up there either for the crowd because for them to be on point shoes, if they slip and fall, that would be absolutely terrible. So yeah, we had to put a few um, safety precautions in place. And also the heat, like all of us were just, I mean, we could have gotten heat stroke. So that, that was a pretty challenging performance, but I really love working with Marlo so much. She is a very unusual, classically trained ballerina who I met years ago at Burning Man. And we just synergize so well together. And it's, you know, not all classically trained ballerinas would be so down to just kind of rough all of these elements. And you have to be kind of flexible and creative and adaptable when you're in these types of festival environments. So kudos to them. <laughs> you know, that's something I was thinking about. You know, you're talking about the elements and I was thinking about the string instruments in particular. Like, how do you how do you keep your violin? Like, how do you get it all together? And like, if you've got these really extreme temperature changes and, you know, you've been to Burning Man and like, you know, the dust, like how do you battle the elements when you are out there? <laughs> That's a great question. Actually, probably the most challenging environment is more humid heat. Dry heat is not so terrible for a violin. Cold, cold is also terrible for a violin. It's more about the humidity levels, the dryness levels. So for Coachella, I played my electroacoustic five string realist violin and that one is, it, so it's a hybrid. So it has a, a jack on it so I can uh, plug in my wireless system and be able to dance or move around the stage. But it has the body of an acoustic instrument. So it has a bigger, bolder sound. You know, a lot of electric instruments, electric string instruments in particular, they can tend to kind of sound a little tinny or thin and I'm an audiophile. So, you know, I'm always finding ways to like warm up the sound, make it bigger, make it rounder, more, more beautiful. So for Burning Man, I actually bring my electric five string, which is a carbon fiber violin from the UK by this company called Bridge and electric violins. So this one is a hollow carbon fiber electric violin and it has some body, it has some resonance. I think the other tricky thing is the bow, you know, it's real horsehair mm. on the bow yeah. and you have to have a certain amount of tension on the bow in order to be able to, you know, it's very intricate, but if there's too much tension or not enough tension in the bow hair, it makes it very difficult to play. But the most challenging thing is the dust like Coachella is very dusty. So yes. is Burning Man. Yes, it is. And I use rosin. Well, string players use rosin on their bow. And rosin comes from pine sap. So it makes the horsehair very gritty and stick to the strings. Well, dust kind of negates that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's tricky. But I think we do it for the excitement and the love. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't bring my my 1923 violin to any of these conditions. That one just is for the studio. Do you have like festival bows that go out? Like these are my bows that go to, to yes. Burning Man. I love that. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> I actually broke a bow once in mid-stroke and I had to finish the show with a broken bow. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of like a badge of honor. I feel like you should get like a, a merit badge for that. Thank you. You know, going back to that set, like in 2017, like, are there still any moments of it that you think about and you think about that performance and have just really stuck with you? Yes. Right before Coachella, we had to get together and, and rehearse. We had all this new choreography for um, one of the tracks that I particularly remember for that Coachella performance, because it was the first time we were doing this live. So it was, you know, a lot of anticipation. And so this track is called Salt. And I had just released that track in 2017. And it's a kind of this beautiful, ephemeral, um, Icelandic 
track. So I sing in Icelandic and then it kind of goes into this heavier kind of, I like to think of it as Icelandic metal, but it's not, it's like my own version. Um, these big choruses and then there's this um, beautiful violin that comes in and then we go back to the Icelandic verse that I'm singing. Do you want to hear a tiny bit of it? <laughs> yes, yes we do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Salt Sjófar Salt Sjófar Tár Of Sins Salt Sjófar So we had all this choreography and the dancers are moving alongside me and the very end of this song I do this really high note and it's just this victorious moment and we end it with this choreography where I'm dancing with the ballerinas and we finish it off with this like really amazing moment that keeps coming to mind when I think about that Coachella performance because it was so powerful. And actually the start of my solo project, it was in 2013, I traveled to Iceland. I had just left this photography job where I was the managing editor and I was really bummed. I was like, what am I going to do? I had my band. I, you know, was just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And my dear friend Arana was like, I'm doing this retreat in Iceland. Why don't you come be the photographer for this retreat? And so I decided to jump on board, you know, what better way to shift perspective than to go on a trip to a country you've never been to before. So I packed all my photography gear, I packed all of my music gear, and I packed, you know, some skirts and some cowboy boots and things like, you know, when you're hiking in Iceland, you can still look cute. That was always my motto is like, you're going to climb some, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go I love hike that. to this hot springs. And Arana and I both had like our fry boots, like our cute boots and our leggings and then like a fun skirt. And everyone else is like, oh, we only brought yoga gear. Like, well, now we're going out to eat. Well, I guess we have to wear our yoga gear and our sneakers. But she and I were like, you can hike in fry boots. You can fix a car in fry boots. You can do anything. So I brought my music gear too. And I just booked an extra week in Iceland without really knowing where I would stay or what I would do. And I ended up connecting with this friend who was going to Russia. So she's like, just stay in my apartment. And so everything fell into place. And I ended up traveling to Thingvitlir, which is a very popular place to go, but it's where the tectonic plates of the two continents meet. And if you're a scuba diver, you can go scuba diving in the Thingvitlir Lake, but I am not a scuba diver. There fortunately was a land path where you could actually walk between the two tectonic plates. So I'm walking and I have my phone and I'm just, you know, singing these melodies into my, the, all these melodies are coming to me. So I take out my voice app and I record those into my phone. And there was just so much inspiration, like going hiking to these beautiful, like hidden secret hot springs and, you know, just the environment. I ended up going to the Vesmanear Islands. I had met this, you know, very nice Icelandic man. Um, it's always good to have a, you know, a man with a car. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so... <laughs> We, we ended up traveling to these islands and I had heard about these caves in Iceland on the, these Vesmaniar islands. And um, these caves are so resonant. So I actually brought my violin with me and we prearranged that I could play violin in these caves. So we're on this like jet ski tour with 40 other Icelanders and we come to these caves and I pull out my violin and I start playing and the echoes and the reverberations in this cave. It was just so beautiful. So anyway, all this inspiration, I come back and I'm like, yeah, thank goodness I don't have that photography job anymore with the managing editor job. I'm like, music, yes. And so I um, got this scholarship to go to Dubspot, which is a music production school in New York, which is where I was living at the time. 
And so I started going to this, you know, six month logic producers course, writing so much music, writing all of these, you know, ideas and like trying to figure out all the pieces. I had a band before, so I kind of knew this fullness of music that I wanted to create, but I didn't have all the skills yet, you know, like how do I write drum parts? How do I write bass lines? How do I, you know, put all these ideas together? How do I do transitions? That's a big one. And then how do you finish your music? So six months, super intensive. And I started to write this track called Brim Al Mar, which is the very first song that I released. And Brim Al Mar is based on a Norwegian folk song. So this kind of solo iteration started to emerge. And my very first show as a solo artist, I got booked as an in-between act at the Hammerstein Ballroom sold out show for Spongle Live and Future Primitive. I had never performed on a stage by myself before. And the main thing that I was most nervous about was don't fall. Whatever you do, don't fall. Like this <laughs> huge <laughs> concert hall, everybody's looking at me. And I'm wearing like a kind of a masquerade costume with like these knee high, um, like high heeled boots. I don't know why I wore that. You know, like if you're nervous, you could fall if you're wearing high heels. I mean, I'm really klutzy. I can fall just wearing flats. So I understand. I'm, I'm totally with you. I'd also be like, don't fall, don't fall, don't trip. You can yeah, do this. Trip. <laughs> so I, I was able to play this Norwegian folk song that was kind of still in development and test it out on this audience. And it was so, it was so stunning. It was amazing. And um, actually, side note, Alex and Allison Gray were in the crowd. And because I was this surprise act, um, I had performed many times at Cosm. I have a long time relationship with them. And they're like, doesn't that sound like Hana? And then they look at the stage and they're like, it is Hana. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's so cool. I I love that. I love that. And all from, and you know, when we were talking about, we've been talking about the Lab a little bit today. I miss the Lab. I haven't had, you know, I'm used to getting at some point in April texts from like everybody I'm at Coachella with to tell me who the surprise guest is at the Lab, And I haven't had that. I feel like, my my heart is incomplete right now. I'm a huge do lab person. That's the first place I go every time I go to Coachella. I love the super soakers. I love the fact you can go there and get refreshed. I love that Hana's played there. It's just an oasis of creativity and art and beauty within Coachella. And everything about the do lab, it just represents the evolution of Coachella, right? Because it used to be in the middle and it used to be just like a place that you would go kind of like in between the outdoor stage and the main stage. And there was horrible sound bleed. But now it's its own thing. It's its own festival within the festival. And it's this place where like you can see the future of the festival. Like you're saying there, you know, like Odessa played the Do Lab the year before they played in the Mojave stage or the Gobi stage. I forget one, which one it was. But like that's that's the future of Coachella in a lot of ways. We're seeing it all in that like smaller stage, which is always super exciting, right? I think Tourist played in the Do Lab and and then he got a slot on a bigger stage. And you know, we've all seen like amazing surprise sets there. So many artists have played there and then gone on to bigger stages. I just saw that FKJ played there. Uh-huh. I think in that same year, 2017, that um Hana played there. I might be wrong about that, but yeah, so many artists have played the do lab and have gone on to bigger and greater things it's it's the perfect um festival within the, the launch festival. pad yep and at the same time you have bigger artists who come mm -hmm. back because the do lab is just the place to be i mean i we've all seen secret sets there mm -hmm. the last set i saw at coachella was at the do lab i saw the rufus du soul secret set they came and headlined uh, or you know they closed the stage out on uh that sunday night and uh at the end, you know what they ended with was uh, the talking heads they played out talking heads that was that was the last thing i heard at coachella before the pandemic tell me more about that so what 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 did they play it was just like a dj set where they played talking yeah heads? they just played a dj set they played just a great like all that rufus to soul vibes but as a dj set and and you know they played they played like some extended cuts of their songs and then uh yeah it was just it was this great little little end of the end of the weekend party you know for Rufus DeSoul and all of their friends and all the do-labbers. 
was great. And did you get like a text message that that was happening? Like, is that how that works? Because those secret sets, they're like, they're very secret. It's all word of mouth. Um, uh, and I have, I have, uh, I have some great friends that are in the do lab. So I was, I'm lucky enough at this point after all the years that I've been going, I get, I get, I get the perks of the do lab. I get to have veggie burgers backstage with them too. They have the best veggie burgers at the festival. If you can get, get in on that. This is very true. <laughs> this is very true. The right. best veggie burgers, but you know, I think like the biggest one had to be when Skrillex played. Mm. Like that was just yeah. massive. Like, that place was going to collapse. Literally. You could just, it was just the energy there was like overflowing. Word got out on that one for sure. But, you know, we are talking with someone today who's actually played with Skrillex, and it is not you or me or Tom. It's not me. <laughs> not me. Not Tom? Caleb, didn't you play? I, or, <laughs> I think it was you, Vanessa, right? Mm-mm, it wasn't me. Nope. Nope. I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe on his Warp Tour days, that, that might have been the only time you would have seen me with Skrillex. I brought my I brought my bows with me. Nope, I didn't. That was you. It was you, Hannah. <laughs> well, what do you know? It was me. Yeah, I, I feel like that seeing Skrillex performing at the Do Lab in 2017, that year that I performed at the Do Lab stage, well, fast forward quite a few months at Burning Man, and there I am, part of the Abraxas camp. I was just going to take a nap because I had been up for many, many performances and many shows and running around. And then I hear my campmates announcing, hey, we're doing a tour with the Golden Dragon. We're doing a you know, a sunset art tour with Skrillex. And I was like, oh, should I bring my violin? I was like, yes, I'm going to bring my violin and my pedals and I'll just be prepared for whatever. And so I get dressed in a cute outfit and I'm tired, but I'm like, whatever, this is amazing. So I go to the art car and I ask one of my friends to introduce me to Sonny. And they're like, oh, you haven't met him. Okay, cool. You know, Sunny, meet Hana. And um, she brought her violin. She's an amazing violinist. And he's like, oh, yeah, you want to plug in and throw down with me? I was like, yes, I would love that. That would be amazing. And so they get me all set up and sound checked. And he's like, you know, I don't have any of my music with me. I just have these like dub and like down tempo tracks. And I was like, no, that's fine. Uh, So we do this tour, this art tour of Burning Man. Um, at sunset we're traveling around on the big golden dragon and Skrillex and I are playing for like an hour we're just throwing back and forth everything that I was playing he would match me like he's amazing at just you know affecting tracks with this very broken control I don't even know how he was doing it because everything was dusty and broken and he didn't even have his music but we were reading each other's minds and matching each other note for note And at one point I handed him my violin and then I went to the decks. And so he was like trying to play the violin. I was like doing the faders. And at the end of our performance, uh, he said, you know, every thousand years we find each other and we play together. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It was amazing. How cool is that? that? Yeah. Yeah. Skrillex, we're going to meet again. We're going to write a track together. I know this. It doesn't have to be in a thousand years, Skrillex. That's what we're trying to tell you. (laughs) Yes. It could be tomorrow. (laughs) Anyone knows Skrillex people? You know, let's let's connect those dots again so it doesn't have to be a thousand years. I I love love that. that. Yes. Dreams can come true. On the art tour too, because like I, I, one of our photographers has gone to Burning Man just seeing the just the stunning art pieces it's just and on that you know we talk we talked on a lot here about how magical it is on the polo field and i feel like you know the playa is the same way and even though i haven't been there it's like you can you can feel it feel the energy almost through the photo so that's just that's wonderful how cool is that you know you're talking about burning man and how that was just such a, a really great performance and how magical that was you also had like a really magical performance in abu dhabi on new year's eve a few years back right yes <laughs> you know abu dhabi is an amazing place and i got booked for this three-day new year's eve festival it was run by the government government funded festival and 
the person who reached out to my team to book me was actually somebody I had met at Burning Man, this guy named Firas, and he works for a cosmetics company called Tarte. So a few years prior to this, I had done this sunrise set, you know, it was amazing, people giving me gifts, like, you know, it's their way of appreciation for like an amazing performance. And this guy hands me a tube of lipstick, this little, little red tube of lipstick from Tarte Cosmetics. And, you know, I just put it in my case. I'm like, I, I don't know. Do I really want to wear that? I don't know. And the following year, I pull out my violin case, you know, my dusty violin that I only bring to the playa. And there's this tube of lipstick. And I end up meeting him again at the playa. And we have these adventures together. And, you know, he ended up being part of this booking crew for this New Year's Eve festival. And he immediately thought of me and submitted my info and... um so the festival, they're pretty conservative because, you know, it's Abu Dhabi. And, but they really liked my image, my press photo. So I ended up being the only U.S. artist that was booked for this festival. And, you know, getting over jet lag, landing there, um, they had this big entryway to the festival with all of the artists' images on this pathway. And so I'm driving up there in this golf cart, you know, going to go scope out the situation for the next day for my sound check. And there is this huge poster of me, like, probably 20 feet tall. Nice. And I get out and we take a photo and these local women, they're like, oh my God, it's Hana. <laughs> and you know, my name written Arabic kind of looks like Lila. <laughs> so my name in Arabic and my artist name Hana on this big 20 foot tall poster. And they recognize me taking a photo with my photo. And they're like, <laughs> oh my God, can I get your autograph? So that was a really surreal moment, you know, to feel famous across the globe. So the next evening I do my whole show on this big electronic stage. And I, I had one of the people there um, be my costume designer because I wasn't sure what to wear for something a little more conservative, you know, like, can I show my shoulders? Can I show my ankles? I don't know. Um, so she brought all of these costumes for me and somehow knew my, I mean, I gave her my size, but like everything she picked fit me so perfectly. And, um, so that was just a really cool moment. And right after my performance on this big electronic stage, you know, like with all of these electronic elements and, you know, weaving this whole story, these people have never heard my music before, most of them. So it was pretty amazing. And then I got whisked over to the main stage where the New Year's Eve countdown was happening. And I'm supposed to quickly change my outfit to a different outfit. And then I'm part of this whole performance with all these ballerinas and dancers and fire spinners. And I'm, my part is that I get pushed out onto this moon structure, <laughs> this like foam moon. And, um, and then I do this violin solo and it's like the 10 minute performance, big show countdown right before new year's Eve. So yeah, it was pretty surreal. Pretty amazing. Wow. It sounds like a, an amazing experience. Super fun. Yeah. And so it was that big concert, that big, you know, New Year's Eve is always pretty chaotic. Like, I mean, it maybe it wasn't this last year for all of us all stuck at home. But that year, then, then we ended up going to the Liwa Desert and seeing the full moon reflecting in this vast desert where Star Wars was filmed, actually. So it's this beautiful contrast of like the festivities and the big performance and the, you know, the chaos and the noise and the color and the lights. And then the next day, the next evening to be in complete and utter silence with the full moon and the sand dunes. It was incredible. I love it. What an amazing story. Can you tell us about some of your other favorite experiences that you've had as a performer? Well, one really amazing performance was 2018. I was booked for Intel's main booth at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. 
So I was booked to do this 10 minute performance across the four or five days of the conference at the Intel booth. And that year their theme was all about autonomous cars, uh, like five pillars of new technology. So I had this team of visual artists who were taking an audio feed from my, you know, my tracks, my synths, my violin vocals, kind of, you know, like my whole electronic performance. And they were taking an audio signal and that was affecting the visuals that were projected behind me. So you could visually see how the different frequencies of my yep. sound were affecting the visuals that were being projected. It was super cool. Super it's all next physics, level. right? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty amazing. And so I had this whole show, 10 minute show, but it like basically took up all day because, you know, sound check and getting ready and performing and then relaxing and kind of let so much energy goes into a 10 minute performance. You wouldn't believe. So it was going really well the second day of the, the conference and I'm about to do my performance. I'm backstage. They even built a whole table for my performance. Like they were next level, but you know, it's Intel. They've got their booth, like amazing, amazing people to work with. And so I'm backstage tuning, getting ready to go on stage and the power goes out. You probably all heard of the 2018 blackout at CES. Like, Oh, no, that's, that's right when you're about to play is when the big blackout happens. Well, I was backstage. So yeah, I was uh, like in 10 minutes, I was supposed to go on. And so oh, I'm like, man. well, what are, what do we do? Like, I guess I'll just keep practicing and like tuning and make sure I'm ready because none of us knew if it was going to be 10 minutes or in an hour when the power was going to come back on. And so everybody's panicking, everybody's freaking out. They're like, you know, going to the exit or on their phones, tweeting away. And, and one of the production guys, he's like, go up on stage, go perform, go, go play, just play acoustic. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> so I had um, all this experience performing on the streets in Spain. So I was like, I know how to perform for a crowd. Like, I'll just go out there, perform. So I start the song and like people start looking up and they're like, oh, there's, there's music, there's, there's something happening. And they all like look up from their phones, stop running to the exit and everyone gathers and they all get out their phones and are start lighting me with their lights on their phones. And a cop came over with a battery powered flashlight and a photographer with a battery powered light. So I have this illumination and I start to play and like people are really getting into it. And I start stomping my boot as people are clapping and, you know, it's just so much energy building and it finally ends with like a flourish and everybody's like, Whoa! wow. And the really beautiful thing about that is that you can't dampen the spirit of, of the human connection. And it just reminded that beautiful moment reminded us that we are all human and that we are here and present. So it was just so incredible. And I actually broke Twitter for a moment. It was so crazy. <laughs> I love that you broke Twitter with like this very like real, like analog moment. <laughs> right. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm at CES. Like people use Twitter at CES. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And so was it totally dark in there and then they were just sh like shining flashlights on you while you were jamming out to acoustic violin? Is, is, is that, am I understanding this correctly? Yeah. So the Intel booth was pretty close to the, one of the entrances. There was some, a tiny bit of light, but it was, it was dark. It was like the whole show floor, the entire conference hall was blackout. And so as people are exiting, because they don't know what to do, they hear this acoustic violin being played and these people gathering. And yeah, yep. so they, they needed to get out the cell phone lights and the battery powered lights so people could see me because otherwise it would have been in total darkness. It was a, a superhuman way, you know, unifying and reminding people to breathe and connect in a human way and no tech involved. Super amazing. I love it. 
It's beautiful. Hannah, it's been really great to have you on the podcast. I heard you on Clubhouse event where you were talking about the future of live music. And it was so fascinating because you were talking about the future of, of live music and talking about how you recently played an event in Arizona and where live music is going. But the fact that you play stringed instruments was so meaningful because I come from a background of live music around string instruments. My mother is actually a stringed music teacher where my whole life I've been surrounded by cello and violin and viola. Um, she actually is a teacher of something called the Suzuki method. And my mother has taught hundreds of children in my hometown these these musical instruments. And it's something that has just surrounded me my whole life. And then I, I got to learn these instruments when I was a child and transitioned when I was a little bit older to playing guitar and then switching over to bass guitar. And I just love these instruments. And there's something so natural and beautiful about stringed instruments. So it's really meaningful for me to have you on the podcast. And I'm really curious to hear you speak a little bit about kind of the future of live music around these instruments and just the future of live music in general. Yeah. I mean, actually stumbling into Clubhouse a few months ago has been such a breath of fresh air, you know, to really be able to connect with people and to make this connection with you, Tom, and then to meet Vanessa and Caleb. Like, it's so cool how it is bringing us together in this really global way. And I think that the reason why it's, it's, you know, really connecting the dots for so many people is because it's a way for us to connect with people in a way that's very human, very connected, and you get a chance to meet all of these incredible people. Yeah. Clubhouse is really cool. It's so amazing. I'm I'm a I'm a Clubhouse addict, I have to say. <laughs> but, you know, it's really impactful. Like I was just in a room today and um, actually one of these yoga teachers that I've collaborated with years ago when I toured with Wanderlust, he was in the room where I was speaking. So now I'm going to go connect with him. Anyway, one thing I didn't mention earlier on about when I was producing my solo project, I work a lot with cellists too and violists. And actually my bigger vision for the future of a live show when it's safe to do so, is to have a string trio with me on stage and me resampling them and, you know, doing this whole kind of like hybrid acoustic string, kind of more classical, and then me with my more electronic sound. You know, I think why people feel so connected to strings is because especially the violin is the closest instrument to the human voice. Yep. And it's they're such versatile instruments. I mean, most cultures have some form of a violin or a stringed and bowed instrument. And there's just so many nuances you can play on a string instrument. And actually, my favorite instrument is the cello. If I were to do it all over again, I'd probably play cello. But I have worked with numerous cellos and recording them for my performances my most recent favorite cellist is Hilary Flowers. And, you know, we did this Panera Bread 20 year anniversary performance in Boston. Shout out to Panera. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, celebrate their 20 year anniversary. And so I had the synth bass player, Ian, and then Hilary on electric cello. And, you know, the other thing too is that classically, most cellists sit down. Well, what's really cool is that we organized for her to play standing up. So she pulls out her end pin super long. She's also very tall. So, you know, we had to kind of figure out like what height of shoes she could actually wear for this performance. Because if I'm standing playing violin and, you know, doing synths and all the things that I do, and then if she's standing as well, it just makes the performance that much more dynamic. But um, yeah, so the future of live events, like it's it's a really interesting landscape. There are so many unknowns. But I was asked to perform for this uh, three-day 
event and I would be the final act of this three-day event in Phoenix, Arizona. So this place called the Herberger Theater, this really amazing theater, at the beginning of the pandemic had built this big, beautiful outdoor stage. Well, they hadn't had a chance to be able to use it because they kept having to postpone the shows. And um, so we finally, finally got this three-day show run booked with two local bands for the first two nights. And then the final evening on Saturday night was me, uh, Hana, a one-woman orchestra. And um, we sold it out and we kept having our fingers crossed, like, is this actually going to happen? I was also very careful in my announcing of the show, you know, like socially distanced, like dance in your bubble, uh, you know, like all the safety precautions. I'm very sensitive to the landscape right now of like, how can we bring people together safely, have an enjoyable experience, have a beautiful experience but with also being mindful of the collective, mindful of how do we accomplish this? You know, we're all navigating this interesting landscape. And the thing I miss most about performing is the feeling and the energy of a crowd, of an audience to play for live people. Like I've done some live streaming and it's just not the same, you know? Yeah. Like being able to actually feel people's energy. And I translate that into my performance. Like I will make decisions on the fly, what's coming up next in my set based on how I feel the audience is responding. And so, yeah, big stage all to myself. You know, I have all these dance moves and, but, but like what's really interesting is for this particular show, you know, it's like looking out at this very distanced crowd and trying to feel the energy and everyone's looking at me. So I felt kind of like a fish in a glass fish bowl. And I knew I wanted some element to really make people feel together. So I actually had organized for these LED candles. So everyone got an LED candle when they arrived. And then at one point during the set, you know, I had everyone turn on the candles and it was like this beautiful collective moment where I could look out in the crowd and everyone has a candle and, you know, people ended up doing like Instagram stories about their candles and their dance moves and their shadows. And it was so beautiful. And you know, it was the first live concert that many of these people had seen in a year. It was my first concert that I had performed in over a year. And there was a lot of pressure on myself that I was putting, but I think we pulled it off beautifully. Like it was so safe, so beautifully executed, um, you know, having a team having front of house engineer as well you know it's like everything came together well so I don't know what the future of live events are but I do think that they pulled it off in a really stunning really safe really amazing conscious way so I would like to see more of that people need connection people need live music like music is the soundtrack yep. to our lives but in these in between times i think it's up to all of these you know like forward thinker promoters and organizers to do them in a safe way yeah i mean that's a big theme of what we talk about here is that the number one indicator of human happiness is the, your relationships and music is extremely powerful force in that so it's not just frivolous fun it's not just partying it's like these are some of the most important things that will happen to someone in their entire life is the amazing connections they, that they have through music and music festivals so i'm i'm 100 percent with you that that's why we do this that's why we take the time to promote music festivals and specifically coachella but just the entire theory and philosophy behind it, we, we see the value in that. And I love that you went that extra mile to give everyone their candles because it's um, it creates that light that you could see as, a, as an artist performing from the stage. And it sounds like a really beautiful experience that I hope we can all have very soon. So 
you know, Hannah, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Hope to see you, you know, live soon. And, you know, I think that wraps it up. Thank you so much. Yeah, my biggest vision is to be able to play at Red Rocks with a whole orchestra. Like, just putting that out there because dreams can come true. Uh, I really love what you're all about and the really beautiful thoughtfulness you put into this podcast. It's been such fun to be with you on this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hana, thank you so much for joining us. You've been such a wonderful guest. Tell our listeners where they can find you all over the internet. Thank you so much. I had so much fun chatting with you all. This has been amazing. So you can find me on Instagram. This is Hana, H-A-A-N-A. Or YouTube, you can see some of the official music videos I've done with my ballerinas or my teardrop. Um, And that's youtube.com slash Hana, H-A-A-N-A. Or, you know, Facebook, Spotify, Apple Music, anywhere, really. Just make sure you put those three A's in there. (laughs) And if you want to follow the podcast, you can follow us at Can't Feel the Heat on Instagram. We're also at can'tfeeltheheat.com. You can follow Caleb at Calebowski on Instagram and the Calebowski on Twitter. You can follow me at at Vanessa Franco on Twitter. And you can stay in touch every week about all the latest music festival news on with my Festival Pass newsletter. And you can find that at pe.com slash newsletters. Look for Festival Pass. Thanks so much and we'll talk to you all soon. <laughs> <laughs>